Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Garreau. I'm going to be showing you the presentation that I just made last week in Paris at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Conference of Parties 21 in Paris, France, where the world's uh, leaders of nearly 200 countries were joined together to supposedly come up with a climate change convention to deal with the future that lies ahead with um, trying to control global warming. And um, in my view, they have fallen far short of that, and I will explain that a little bit in the presentation that I made to some of the delegates in Paris at the wider Caribbean pavilion and in a special session called Blue Guardians, Protecting Oceans and Enabling Blue Economies. The first part of the talk, which I'm going to give, is focused on the issue of global climate change and how to reverse it, what the possibilities are and how that could be done realistically with what we already know. The second half of the talk, which there was not time to present fully in Paris, is going to deal with marine ecosystem restoration, and so I'll deal with that as a separate subject in the second half. <clears throat> okay, I'm now going to uh, go to look at the PowerPoint presentation that I made at the time, and I will follow through in that order. <clears throat> okay, the first part of the talk is geotherapy, how to reverse global warming. And we're talking here about restoring the global biogeochemical functions of our natural ecosystems that regulate and stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere, but also our weather, our climate, our water resources, our soil fertility, and the productivity of our marine habitats. All of these are regulated by the biota, the growing living ecosystems on, in the world that whose ecosystem services are our fundamental life support systems on this planet. Without them, they would not be regulated at the safe levels we'll come to enjoy and that we need to maintain for the future. <clears throat> So in particular, we're going to be asking the question, how can we stabilize CO2 at safe levels? And therefore, the question is, what are the safe levels and how do we achieve them? <clears throat> now, right now, coral reefs can't take any further warming. We're already at the upper limit of the most productive and biodiverse ecosystem in the entire ocean. Something like a quarter of all the fish in the sea live in coral reefs, yet they occupy only one-tenth of one percent of the ocean surface. So they're 250 times richer than the ocean as a whole in terms of biodiversity. And they're already at or above their upper limit. They simply can't take any more warming. And we've known that now for 25 years, because 25 years ago that I developed the so-called hotspot method for predicting coral bleaching from NOAA satellite sea surface temperature data, and we've been able to accurately predict for 25 years exactly when and where conditions get too hot for corals, the point at which they bleach. And we've been able to do that accurately, so we know every major case in the world that happens. That was the first ecosystem anywhere in the world to be shown to be already affected by global climate change, to have been pushed to their upper limit and beginning to be affected on a worldwide scale by high temperatures. So for 25 years, we've known exactly when and where these events are going to take place. And for the last 25 years, governments have refused to act. They've simply sat back and let our reefs die for 25 years. In 1992, I warned the Association of Small Island States Delegates at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, where they first signed the treaty. And I warned them that if they did not insist on a treaty that was strong enough to protect their coral reef ecosystems, they would be the first to pay the price. And that if they didn't get a strong enough treaty to, to protect coral reefs and the effects of global warming, they would lose most of their corals in the next 20 years from the effects of high temperatures and land-based sources of pollution. And that's exactly what happened. Over the last 25 years, we've known when and where it's going to happen, and governments have refused to act even though we've shown that these ecosystems can't take any more warming. So therefore, when I hear a lot of talk at this convention that two degrees C warming is acceptable, I have to ask, who are they talking about? That's not acceptable for coral reefs. It's not acceptable for any of the more than 100 countries for whom coral reefs are their major source of biodiversity, their major source of fisheries, their major source of beach sand, their major source of their tourism economy and the major source of their fisheries habitat for their food. So coral reefs are already being severely affected. And we've already lost most of the corals in the world to high temperature. So it's really, we're, we're already well over the cliff in that sense. Two degrees is a death sentence for coral reefs. They just can't take any more. 
Two degrees warming means basically losing all of the ecosystem serves that coral reefs provide. Small island states, low-lying islands, beaches, fisheries, tourism, and the whole bit. And therefore, it means losing those islands, the low-lying islands all around the world. In fact, it's much more of a death sentence than people realize. I think people who say that two degrees C is an acceptable rate of warming clearly don't remember what the world was like the last time it was two degrees warmer than today. They've forgotten. Well, we, we remember, but I'll show you in a minute. But meanwhile, in the last 15 years, in the last 15 years, it's estimated that 60% of all of the global economic losses from all degradation of all ecosystems worldwide, and nearly 60% of that degradation is due to coral reefs alone. Again, coral reefs occupy less than one-tenth of a percent of the ocean, about 0.08% of the whole surface of the earth, and yet we're paying 60% of the ecosystem economic losses in coral reefs. So this is more than 600 times the global average. So people living on these islands already are suffering. They don't have food, they don't have, the beaches are washing away, and they're in a very critical situation if they want to save their islands themselves from disappearing. So the small island states are already paying that price. So when people say two degrees C is safe and acceptable a rate of climate change, they must be insane because they don't remember what it was like the last time it was two degrees warmer than today. And here is the fossil sea level in Jamaica where we have it perfectly preserved. This is the last time sea level was about two degrees C warmer than today. And that mark marks where the sea level cut its way into the cliff. Below there was coral living in the ocean. Above that was land. And we can see the present sea level in the background in this picture in Jamaica. And that's seven meters lower than the time the sea level was at, at the time the sea level notch formed. Last time it was two degrees warmer, sea levels were seven degrees, seven meters, sorry, seven meters higher than they are now. And it was two degrees C warmer. And at that time there were hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England. In front of this fossil sea level was a magnificent coral reef, and the lower part of that reef has all the corals intact in position of growth growing up. And then the upper part of that fossil reef, everything is dead, smashed, flattened, and lying on its side and broken. So it looks as though the reefs around the equatorial zone of the world actually died from high temperatures and were then destroyed at that time. It was two degrees warmer than today. And at that time, CO2 in the atmosphere is about 270 parts per million. Right now, it's 400 parts per million. This time, it was only 270 parts per million. So it shows what sort of response we can expect <clears throat> for today's level of CO2 in the atmosphere. 400 ppm, sea level will be much higher and temperature will be much higher. And we can say how much higher they're going to be by looking at the global climate records for nearly a million years that are recorded in Antarctic ice caps, they're recorded in deep sea sediment cores, and they're recorded in fossil corals. This shows, for instance, the fossil coral reefs of Jamaica, that ancient sea level that we were looking at was seven meters above. Here's today's sea level with the modern reef, and there was that ancient reef from 120,000 years ago that grew up higher and then died from high temperatures because two degrees C was too warm for them to tolerate. And sea level, as I say, was seven meters higher. That means all the great coastal cities of the world would be underwater. London, New York, Paris, Shanghai, Bombay, Chennai, et cetera, et cetera, Lagos, on and on. So when we look at the actual climate record, here is the last 800,000 years of CO2. And every time CO2 goes up, the climate gets warmer. When it goes down, it gets cooler. And at that time, 120 to 130,000 years ago, the CO2 was about 270 parts per million. Right now, it's at 400. We haven't yet felt the impact of that high CO2, and there's a very simple reason that's been forgotten in the IPCC projections, and that is that it takes 1,600 years for the ocean to turn over. The ocean has been chilled by cold water in contact with the glacial ice caps. It's chilled to the temperature of a refrigerator, and that cold water sunk to the bottom, and the whole ocean basins are filled with refrigerator ice water. Until that deep sea warms up, we won't feel the full effect of warming at the surface. The deep ocean holds about 95% of the total heat capacity of the Earth's system. That's including 
the oceans, the ice caps, the biota, the soils, everything. It's the water that holds that temperature. And so until the deep ocean warms up, we won't feel the full effect of the surf. And it will take 1,600 years for that ocean to gradually turn over and warm up. So there's a built-in 1,600 year time lag in the system, which is why we have not yet felt the impacts of 400 ppm. That lies far in the future, but IPCC projections for climate change are only for 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100 years for a process that takes more than 1,600 years. Therefore, it's missing more than 90% of the impacts. And therefore, IPCC projections are serious underestimates. What this means is that there's no way to hold global warming to 2 degrees C at the present level of CO2. There's no way to do that with emissions reductions alone. It simply can't be done. Now, because of this time lag in the system, that means we have to act very quickly if we want to reduce CO2 to safe levels. And uh, we have to do it before the deep ocean warms up, because then we're in serious trouble. So how can we do that? These graphs here show nearly a million years of climate data. They show CO2 versus temperature and temperature versus sea level. Now, there are a couple of very important points here. If we take a look at where we are today in CO2, we're at 400 ppm. If we take a look at the way temperature and, and, and uh, CO2 have behaved over the last 800,000 years and follow that line, what that says is that we should once we come to steady state with the present level of CO2, we should come to a temperature that's about 17 degrees centigrade or Celsius higher than today. Not 2 degrees, 17 degrees. And the sea level for that condition would be about 23 meters above today's sea level. 23 meters. This is for today's CO2 level. That's where we're headed. 23 meters is about 75 feet higher sea level. So you can imagine that billions of people will be forced to leave the land. Sea level 75 feet higher. So 400 ppm is clearly not safe. We can ask also, what would it be like for 350 ppm? We hear countries saying, oh, 350 ppm is safe. Well, 350 ppm translates to a temperature rise of about 12 to 13 degrees centigrade, and a sea level rise also of about 12 to 13 meters. That's what 350 implies. If we want to be at safe levels with regard to today's temperature and today's sea level, then we need to lower CO2 down to about 260 parts per million. It's that simple. That's what the scientific data shows of global climate change and how the system behaves in the long run. And our responsibility is to deal with the long-term problem. So the question now is, how can CO2 be put, in, put away and removed from the atmosphere? No amount of emissions reductions can do that, because if we stop all emissions reductions completely, that excess CO2 is still in the atmosphere. It has to be removed. This graph here from IPCC shows the long-term impacts of what happens with CO2. If we burn all the coal and oil in the ground, we'll only have about 100 years or so, and that's this black line here, the CO2 emissions. It just shows 2,000. This is a 1,000 year time scale. So it would burn most of that in 100 years and use up the coal and oil in the ground. And then there won't be any more. So the emissions will drop down to a low volume because we run out of it. But the CO2 in the atmosphere would increase for hundreds of years and level off. And they would stay high for thousands of years afterwards. Because that excess CO2 in the atmosphere, as I'll show you, gets mixed down, taken up by the plants in the ocean, and eventually, on a very long time scale, de gets deposited in the sediments as limestone or organic carbon in, this, in deep sea sediments. But that takes thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years for that CO2 pulse to come down. So that means that the CO2 would stay high. And the temperatures in the red line here would stay high. And after a 1,000 years, you see temperatures reach approaching the equilibrium. And remember, it takes 1,600 years for the deep ocean to warm up. And it's achieving the steady state. And it's going to stay high again for tens of thousands of years before that eventually comes down. So temperature would go up if we don't remove CO2. And then we can consider now the expansion of the ocean. As the ocean warms up, it expands. It gets, occupies less volumes. This dark blue line is ocean expansion. After a thousand years, after we run out of CO2 in the atmosphere, the ocean is still expanding. 
as it warms up. <laughs> and then this line here, which is still increasing after 1,000 years, is the melting of the ice caps and glaciers. So that's rising sea level, and that will continue 5,000 years or more. So the impacts of increased CO2 in the atmosphere has geophysical consequences for the entire planet that would last hundreds of thousands of years before they disappear, unless we find a way to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, and that's, that's the point of the rest of this talk. We have to find a way to avert a disaster of CO2 building up and causing runaway increasing in temperature and sea level.